Please state and spell your first and last name. Brian Gibson, B-R-I-A-N, G-I-B-S-O-N. And um, Lieutenant Gibson, how are you employed? Uh, I work for Henry County Fire Department. And how, have, how long have you been employed with Henry County Fire Department? I started in 1994, 25 years. And what positions do you hold or have you held with Henry County Fire Department? Uh, currently I'm holding the position of Captain over Fire and EMS Operations. Um, I've been a paramedic since 1997, also an ACLS instructor for about eight years. And I apologize, Captain. That's okay. And can you tell me a little bit about the training you've had in order to hold the position that you do with Henry County Fire Department? Uh, we typically exceed the minimums in Henry County. We are required to have 40 hours of in-service training to maintain your paramedic. We will exceed that. And uh, also on the fire side, you have a minimum of 240 hours required. And again, we will exceed that you typically. So I'm on track to have like 500 hours this year so far. So everybody usually typically will exceeds the minimum requirements. And how often do you have to update um, your training and certification? For the paramedic, every two years. For the fire, every year. And as part of your training, are you trained in the Heimlich maneuver? Yes. And tell me if you could explain exactly what the Heimlich maneuver is. Just trying to dislodge a foreign airway obstruction in the upper airway. It's typically done by bystanders. And um, to your knowledge, how is it generally performed or taught or, I guess, visualized as to how to do the Heimlich? Uh, typically, you have a, a, a classroom portion, and then they give you some mannequins to practice with. And what portion of the body um, are, I guess, you taught to have to, I guess, touch or handle in order to do the high It's uh, the abdomen just below the rib cage, just below the sternum, and you're forcing up a little bit. In your 25 years as a um, Henry County fire, firefighter, have you, um, sorry, paramedic, have you had occasion to have to perform the high I have never performed the Heimlich maneuver. And why is that? That's because typically the bystanders are the people that are performing the Heimlich maneuver. By the time I get there, it's either dislodged or the patient's worse off and I have to go to the next step. Now let's talk about the ones where it's been dislodged. Um, have you ever had to treat someone where possibly the Heimlich maneuver had not, was not um, performed by someone who was trained to do it? Yeah, typically it's a bystander that may or may not have training, and um, I've never, like I said, witnessed that because I'm typically there after the case. But uh, usually the, the person is happy to be breathing again, and um, no notable injuries that I had, have noticed at that time. Okay, and tell us a little bit about CPR and your training with that and exactly what CPR is. Uh, CPR is basically uh, breathing and mechanically moving the heart for the patient when they're not breathing and their heart's not working. Um, so that's something that we typically do. We do quite a bit in this county. Uh, it's a very busy county. Um, and that's what we'll do to try to jump start the heart, see if we can give them a chance. And is there a difference between how you perform CPR on an adult and how you perform it on a child? There is. It's typically the depth of compressions is for the compressions going to be on your chest. The depth of, of compressions is not quite as far on a child as it is an adult. It's about a half inch difference, though. And um, when you talk chest compressions, um, is there a difference on what type of chest compressions you utilize on an adult versus a child? Yeah, the chest compressions on adults typically two handed, uh, and a child's typically one handed, and infants even the fingertips. And in your course of um, your career, have you have to deal with anyone who's had um, CPR that was performed by someone who was not a medical professional? Yes, most of the time the bystanders or lay people are performing the CPR before we get there. And they're doing the best they can, but a lot of the times it's not correct. And have you, in those instances, seen where there were injuries if CPR was not applied correctly? Not that I have noticed. Let me ask you, were you on duty on November the 17th of 2015? Yes, ma'am. And did you, have, did you get a call at some point in time in regards to a two-year-old child? Yes, ma'am. Do you recall what time that call came in? I would need to reference some paperwork. Mm -hmm. I can't quite remember it. I'd hate to say the wrong time. Uh, 
1721 Lincoln Terrace, McDonough, Georgia. And what time did you arrive at that location? It was, uh, this is going to be the uh, ambulance report that I have in my hand. I was on the fire truck, so it was a little quicker, not very much, but it was 10 and a half minutes. So the other report has the correct time on it. If I read this time, it's not my time. Yes, that's, that that's that yes, ma'am. So we arrived on the scene at seventeen fifty-three sixteen. And um, when you arrived, when you say we, who, who were you with? Myself and firefighter Ken Jones. And we were you were on the fire truck. Is that what yes, ma'am. And what type of equipment do you have um, on that fire truck? As far as medical goes, it's uh, an ALS, which is Advanced Life Support Fire Truck. It has a jump kit or a med bag that has the uh, life-saving cardiac drugs in it, also a uh, automated defibrillator. And when you arrive at that scene, um, what happens at that point? Uh, arrive on the scene, of course, um, we've already gotten some information on the way to the call that uh, CPR was already in progress, meaning the, the child was not breathing and had no pulse. Arrived on the scene and saw, uh, uh, if I remember correctly, it may have been in the cul-de-sac. I may be wrong on that, but it was uh, the front door was open. I exited the truck, obviously called on scene, uh, grabbed our equipment, and headed towards the, the house. Uh, once I walked into the house, I typically, like I always do, announce fire department very loudly, and I heard someone say with a female voice, I'm in here. Did you make entry into the home? Yes. When you made entry into the home, what did you observe? Uh, it was actually a very clean home. Uh, I did observe that um, a female was was uh, delivering rescue breaths to what appeared to be a two-year-old child laying on the floor in front of a coffee table. And um, could you tell whether or not that female was on the phone or not? Yes, she was on the phone and she actually said they are here when we walked in and I assume that was Henry County Dispatch. That's was typically she, the case. Was she on the phone? Was she, was she holding the phone? Was she on speakerphone? Do you recall where the phone I don't was? recall if it was speakerphone or if she was holding it. I don't recall that. And you said that she was giving breasts? Yes. Okay. And who was she giving breasts to? Uh, apparently, Layla Daniels. Okay. Daniel. Oh. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. That's okay. okay. And when you say breasts, is that, just kind of describe that. Uh, it's rescue breathing. The, uh, our uh, 911 system is giving them, you know, information on how to breathe for someone that's not that's not breathing. So she was giving the breaths to the child because, you know, she would apparently was not breathing. So she had her mouth on her mouth, trying to breathe for her. Did you um, observe her giving any chest compressions like you talked about earlier? I did not as I was walking in. Once you get inside and you see her giving breaths, what do you do next? Uh, start looking at the child as I'm walking up, getting a general impression on, on, on what I feel is going on. Uh, the skin is very pale, cyanotic, which means blue around the lips. It's uh, obviously not perfusing very well, which means typically that they're not breathing or their heart's not beating. Okay. Let me stop you there. So what did you observe about the color of her skin? It was very pale and blue around the lips, meaning cyanotic or blue around the lips. And um, did you happen to touch her or feel her? Yes, her skin was warm uh, to the touch. Her core was warm. Her extremities were not as warm as I would like to have felt, but they were still warm, but I wouldn't call them cool at that point. What, what, why would you not like to see them as cool? What concern does that uh, It's just the, on the amount of downtime, if they've been down too long, you know, you have to make a decision as a paramedic whether to work the child or work the patient or not. Uh, of course, with a, a child, we you typically go over the top a little bit. And um, core was warm, so that's all we needed to know to, to move forward with, uh, with the treatment. And when you say core, what part of the body are you talking yeah, the, about? Yeah, the trunk, the entire core here of the body. One. And the extremities, what part of the body are you talking about when you describe Your hands and your legs. Okay. So you touch your core and you touch your arms. 
Um, what do you do next? Uh, feel for a brachial pulse, which is under the arm right here, which is typically how you do it for a child. And I felt no pulse. And at this time, all at the same time, I'm looking for the, your typical airway breathing and circulation. So I'm making sure that they're that seeing if she's breathing at the same time as I'm doing this. And so, you know, there's a, there's a list of things that they, the textbook tells you to do, which is to check for the airway, check for the breathing, check for circulation. When you've been doing it a while, you kind of do all those all at one time all within just a few seconds of each other. So that's what we did, you know, and I grabbed a hold of the, the brachial artery and did not feel a pulse as I'm watching the airway to see if I see any kind of movements, any kind of chest rise, any kind of abdominal rise and fall from breathing. Um, and the did, she, did she have a pulse? No, did not have a pulse. Was she breathing? It was not breathing. And what did that mean to you? Well, the call had, that, that she's, at this point, she's, she's clinically deceased at this point. What do you do you know, having that information that she is clinically deceased? Uh, that means we need to, we need to move forward uh, to the next step, which is to initiate the life-saving measures that we can do. Uh, the call come out as a choking call, so I just, uh, the, the refer, first treatment that I was going to do was try to clear an airway, just in case there was an airway obstruction. Tip, typically, pediatric patients, once you clear the airway obstruction, or take care of any type of respiratory problem, they're very resilient and they come back a lot better. So we want to try to rectify that first, just in case. So I took the child and done five back blows where I have to turn her over and I hold her face in my hand. And that's typically correct. And then you lean them down in this fashion here so gravity works towards your your benefit. And I'm going to give you Stacey's exhibit, exhibit for demonstrative purposes only uh, 228. And if you could demonstrate the actions that you took before <clears throat> using Stacey's exhibit. And I'm doing this on my, my knees. Uh, the child's laying here. Felt a little smaller than this. But you grab by the face and you turn over here where you can hold the head and support the head and, and you give five back blows in this direction here. Just in case something's lost, we can maybe get it out. If it is, my hand's here to support the head and also to catch whatever just come out. So I deliver five back blows, just kind of one of those things to try just before we get started good. And gag the five black blows, roll her back over and begin the next phase. And let's talk about when you rolled her over to, to her back. What did you observe, if anything? Uh, did notice um, quite a bit of bruising. I'll just put this down here. On her back. Was that prior to you administering those five back blows that you talked about? Yes, it was um, a significant amount of bruising on her back, all the way from her diaper up to her neck. Did she have on any clothing when you came into the home? Just, just a diaper laying, laying on a navy blue towel. And I'm going to show you what's already been admitted into, state, into evidence states exhibit number one. And you can direct your attention to the back screen there behind you. Is this what you observed, um, the injuries that you observed to her back when you turned her over for those back legs? Yes, ma'am. And, and as I saw that, I, I asked uh, the, the female that was, was, was sitting there, uh, what's her medical history? And that's a typical question we ask. I want to find out if the child's sick or, or, or something of that nature so we'll know what course of action to take next. Um, but she said uh, she wasn't sure that she was a new foster child. And what did you take that to mean when she said a new foster child? Well, in, in, in my thought process, of course, everything that I do is going to be, it doesn't matter. Uh, we're going to go exactly down the line as far as protocols go. But I thought to myself was, this poor little girl was in a bad situation. Thank God she got out of it. Because I, I had no, you know, it's a new foster child. What's the next thing that you did? Okay, then we roll her back over on her back and uh, have my partner, he's going through the jump kit, I asked him for a BVM, which is a bag valve mask. It's the, it's the bag that has the face mask on it that we breathe for him. And as he's getting that out, um, we're starting compressions. And about that time, just before we really are able to get started on virtually anything, um, the ambulance calls out on the scene. And I believe it was uh, it's a little over two minutes later. 
give me a second, I'll tell you. Seventeen fifty-five thirty is when the ambulance arrived on the scene. So that's two minutes and fourteen seconds later than we arrived. So all this happened in two minutes and fourteen seconds. So then, uh, at that point, when I heard them arrive on the scene, because it is a child and I'm able to move them easily, uh, picked her up with a towel and ran out to the ambulance and met the ambulance crew. Let me ask you, prior to after rolling her over and seeing the bruises on her back, were you still of the mindset that you were dealing with a choking cough? Um, when I when I rolled her, I'm sorry, I asked that again. When you saw the bruises, yes, ma'am. Did it change your mindset as as the type of call that yes. you were working? Yes, yes, it did. At that point, what was your mindset as, the, as to this call? I, I thought the I, like I said, I thought. Poor little girl got out of a bad situation. That's exactly what I thought. So I thought this was a more, maybe even a traumatic thing uh, at some other time. That So, and, you know, it's still acted and treated just like, of course, we, we cover all bases when we're, we're doing it, trying to make sure that we don't have a foreign airway obstruction. And I want to back up to that. When you did those back blows, did anything dislodge from her throat? No. At any time, did you see anything come out? No. And did you do, you said one round of five blows, did you do any more blows after that? No, ma'am. When you arrived and she was not breathing and she did not have a pulse, could you have called it in the field? Uh, that's kind of a judgment call, and, and yes, we could have. Uh, an adult that, and at this time we didn't know the rhythm, and an adult is not as, easily moved so we would have stayed there we would have brought our monitor in and seen the rhythm and had to make a judgment call on how the patient's skin felt the the the, the rhythm that's on the monitor and typically we'll work them in the house meaning we'll start cpr and we'll go through several uh, rounds of drugs call the doctor and get permission to call it and not work it at that point did you do that in this case no ma'am it's a child so we're going to go over the top once the ambulance arrived, what did you do? Uh, picked the child up and ran her out to the ambulance in my arms and uh, put her in the back of the ambulance. The ambulance crew immediately just got out and got right in the back of the ambulance along with my partner. And we began the, the next phase of our working. And what's the next phase of your work? All right, so we're doing CPR, and um, which is, you know, someone's breathing with a bag valve mask. I can't recall who was breathing her at that time. Um, there is a difference between uh, EMS skills. There's a paramedic and then there's an EMT. So there's two paramedics on the scene and two EMTs. The paramedics have responsibilities and the EMT has responsibilities. So the paramedics are the ones that are giving the drugs, intubating, delivering the shocks, and uh, the EMTs are the one that's breathing, doing the compressions, getting the IV, those types of things. So you have two paramedics and two EMTs. Is everyone working? Everyone's working. What were you doing? Uh, I, I, I was getting the airway, which means that um, I, I used some tools to, to stick a tube down her throat to assist her with breathing so that I can breathe for her. I'm going to show you what's been marked and shown to Defense Counsel as States Exhibit 229, 230, and 231. Yes, ma'am. Do you recognize those? Yes, ma'am. And do they fairly and accurately depict these instruments you were just talking about? Yes, ma'am. I'd ask the state's exhibit 229, 230, and 231 be admitted into evidence. Any objection? Would it assist you to utilize those tools in order to demonstrate the action you took to intubate Layla Day? I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. Would it help you to show the jury the yes. instruments you used? Yes, ma'am. I'll go over it piece by piece. This is just a display, obviously. So this is just showing the anatomy we have of the upper airway. And I'll show you what these devices do. This is an adult upper airway. 
So of course a child would be smaller, but everything is the same except for this size. Okay. Are there special tools that you have when you're dealing with a child versus an adult? Yes, just like this, it's called a, laryng a laryngoscope blade. On an adult, it's bigger. The handle is bigger, the blade is different. And you can see that it, when you turn it on, the light comes on. So that I can see, it gives me a flashlight down in the throat. This is called an endotracheal tube. Okay. So this is the tube that goes down the throat into the trachea. That's the windpipe that goes into your lungs so that you can breathe the patient. This is called a stylet that goes into the endotracheal tube and allows me to manipulate the tube into a position that I want so that I can slide it in between the vocal cords. You have to slide this tube in between the vocal cords for it to work. It won't work if it goes in the wrong hole, which means it's in the stomach. We can't breathe in the stomach, right? So we have to bring through the lungs. This is where this comes into play. So it's probably hard for me to show everybody. I'll do my best here. But you have a, this is obviously half of the mouth here. We got the tongue right here. And right below it, there's a little flap where my finger's at called the epiglottis. And it pulls up. There's different ways to innovate, but I use the straight blade, which grabs the epiglottis and pulls all this anatomical structure out of the way. And when it pulls it out of the way, if y'all can see a V in there, that V is the vocal cords. That's where you pass the tube through, and it's critical that you pass the tube through the vocal cords for this to work correctly. So I take this device here, and I enter the mouth like this, and I move all this anatomical structure up, and I grab the epiglottis and move it up out of the way. It gives me a flashlight where I can see the vocal cords very well, and then I can pass the tube through the vocal cords. Let me ask you, with Layla, when you put the instrument in her mouth and pulled it up and turned the flashlight on, did you see anything in the in the in that area, in her vocal cord or in her throat, in any way? No, ma'am. No, no uh, obstruction at all. There was some thick yellow substance around her, her lips, but that's that's fairly typical when somebody's uh, been ad administered rescue breaths. Why is that typical? What happens with your body if you've been administered rescue breaths? Uh, re rescue breaths is not as good as an endotracheal tube, so you're breathing and you've got two holes, one going to the stomach, one going to the lungs. And as you're breathing, it's going in both holes. So it inadvertently gets into the stomach, the stomach gets distended, and then once it gets full, it, it can, it, vomits. So you can have some vomit just to come back on your lips. That's, that's fairly typical. After you put the, the, um, the tool in to see down the throat, what's the next step that you take? All right, so I put the tube in. Obviously, I use this scope. I put the tube in between the vocal cords just as this. We take the stylet out because I no longer need it. At this point, I hold it. A partner puts a bag valve mask on this and they breathe it. And we use a stethoscope to Listen to the lungs just to make sure the air is moving throughout both lungs and make sure you're in the right spot. And then once that's occurred, we secure it with a, a Thomas tube holder. Let me ask you, when you went to put the tube down like the throat, was there any obstruction or any difficulty getting that tube in? No, there's no difficulty at all getting the tube in. And once we started using the bag valve mask, it, it, it uh, performed adequately. Typically, if there's a foreign airway obstruction below the vocal cords, there is some resistance with the bag. And I did not feel that. Um, when you didn't feel that obstruction, did you have any thoughts that went through your mind? Uh, there's, there's, th there was no obstruction there. And I'm showing you what's already been entered into evidence, <coughs> this exhibit number five. And is that the strapping here, what you were indicating that you put on to um, on Se Layla's mouth? Yes, yeah, secure the tube. It's called a Thomas tube holder. It's a piece of plastic that has a bite block in it that goes in between your teeth. Hold your mouth open so your teeth does not obstruct the tube. And it has a little mechanism that uh, twists on the side, a little uh, nylon screw that twists on the side that secures the tube to the Thomas tube holder. The strap goes around the neck, the back of the head, and Velcros to the body. In your experience, does that um, tubing mechanism and strap cause any injury? Uh, no, ma'am. I'm showing you what's been marked as state's exhibit number 232. Um, would the, the strapping mechanism that we're looking at in state's exhibit 5 have caused um, what we see in state's exhibit 232? Not typical, no, ma'am. So once you have the tube secured in and you begin to bag her, what is the next steps that you take? 
Uh, and at this time, there's four people working, so my job was to get the airway, which we did, and other people are doing other things. So we're continuing the, the whole uh, CPR regimen and following what we call ACLS protocols, advanced life support, uh, advanced, advanced cardiac life support protocols. And what do those protocols include? It includes, you know, obviously the CPR portion of it. We're going to put her on the monitor so the cardiac, cardiac rhythm is showing and deliver the appropriate medi cardiac medication for that rhythm. Okay. Let's talk about the, um, are there compressions that's being done? And with States Exhibit 228, can you demonstrate to the jury what type of compressions and how they were being applied to it? Like I said, um, Slide this out of the way right here. Oh, sorry. So typically it's in the nipple line for a child of this age, it's one handed, one and a half inches depth at a rate of at least 100. Okay, we don't have to stop, do the 15 to, to 2, which means 15 compressions to 2 breaths, or 15 or 30 breath, uh, compressions to 2 breaths once you have an advanced airway, which is this endotracheal tube, then it just is a non-stop thing. So it's non-stop compressions once this is in, which that got in pretty quickly. And does that, the tube, the intubation, allow you to breathe for Layla? Yes. At any point, did Layla start to breathe on her own? No. And you showed chest compressions. Um, did, at any point, would it require compressions um, down below in the pelvic area? No, ma'am. In the groin area? No, ma'am. In between her thighs? No, ma'am. On her back? No, ma'am. Under her neck? No, ma'am. Uh, as you're breathing for and doing the compressions, what else is happening? Uh, we're applying the cardiac monitor to see what rhythm she was in, cardiac rhythm. And why is it necessary to determine what rhythm she's in? So that it can uh, guide us on what cardiac medication we need to administer for that rhythm. And what was her rhythm? Assistedly, which is the flat line, no activity. Do you defibrillate her at any point in time? No, that rhythm does not require defibrillation. Why not? Because there's no activity for it to try to jump start, if you will. Because when it's flat line, there's no, no activity at all. And so she was flat line? Yes, ma'am. Um, what do you do to try to provide treatment? Uh, we continue CPR and breathing, and then we uh, we can administer uh, epi, epinephrine. That is the only drug that you can give for um, assistedly. And was Ep that done in this case? Yes. And do you know how many rounds was done? Uh, per the report, it was three rounds. Were you giving those rounds? I was not. I'm going to ask you about state exhibit <coughs> number five. Um, did you know any injury or bruising in, in state exhibit five? Did I note any? Do, yeah, do you see any bruising? Uh, it, just, it just looked like the, and I'm, I'm not 100% sure, but it looked like we had some on the nose here. It may be a little bit of crust uh, from some vomitus on one side, but on the, on the tip of the nose, it looks, looked to me like we had some bruising. Would that have been any, come from any treatment that you provided on that day? No, ma'am. Okay. And what about down here in this area right here on the screen? No, ma'am. That's too high for compressions. So you're giving breath, compressions, epi, what else is happening? And of course the cardiac monitor. Uh, and then at this point we, we move to the phase where we're, we've got an airway secured with the endotracheal tube. We know what rhythm she's in. We know what medicine we need to give, so that's what we're doing. So now we have time, if you will, because we've gotten all the stuff started. And now it's, it's kind of a time to step back and say, okay, what's caused this? And this is where you go over your reversible causes, meaning, all right, what caused it? So one of the things that we can do in the back of the is take a blood glucose level, see what their, their sugar is. So uh, that's typical of what we do on all our cardiac arrest patients. So we went to take a sh sugar, meaning we pricked her finger, got some blood out of it and tested it. And did you find anything from that test? I, I did. and. and it wasn't a remarkable finding. Uh, I, I probably had to dig around in the report to find out what number it was. But as long as it wasn't low, that was the issue, and it was not low. Uh, what else do you, are you doing at this time? Let me ask you, are compressions and breast still be, being given to Layla while you're doing this assessment? Yes. 
typically the EMTs are doing those two things and the paramedics are giving the drugs. Of course, once they secure the airway, then we're bouncing things off each other to say, what's caused this? What can we do to try to reverse it? And what's the next step that you take? Okay, so then we're going over her body from head to toe at that point to, to see if we find something that's abnormal. You know, there's, with a child it's a little different because there's a lot of things that doesn't, doesn't apply to a child, such as, you know, typically a two-year-old's not going to overdose on drugs, typically. So. And let's start with her head. And we've already talked about the nose area. Was there anything else in her head that you found, um, I guess, to be notable? I don't recall anything on her head that was notable. I'm going to show you state's exhibit 21. Did you notice this as you were doing it, an overview of her body? I did not notice that. Is that something that would have been caused by any treatment that you were providing that particular day? No, ma'am. What other things did you notice as you were checking her over? Uh, was you know obviously the bruising. Uh, there was a bruising uh, on her back from her diaper up to her neck. She's laying on her back at this time, so we noticed some bruising on her pelvis and both wrists. I uh, when we was doing the D stick. I can't remember if I was the one that performed the D stick, which is the blood sugar test. But we did notice in my view that um, I took her arm, her left arm, and picked it up and said, "Is her arm broke?" And I manipulated her arm just a little bit to see if it was, if it had any kind of movement or crepitus. And I didn't feel any, but the arm appeared to have a slight curve in it. And so what did that tell you when you asked the question, is the arm broke? It appeared that uh, I was concerned that it may have been broke right then. And, you know, at that point, and then maybe even be um, moving. But, but it wasn't. It, it, felt, it felt intact, but it did have a bow in it. And I'm showing what's been marked and introduced into evidence of states number 34. Is this the arm that we're talking about? I uh, guess, ma'am, it would be the left arm of the child. And what area did you notice uh, that appeared to have a bow in it? And there's a corner right there if you want to use it to, to point it out. Okay. Obviously, this is the wrist, uh, the elbow. So between the wrist and the elbow, you see this deformity. And did you notice anything about the other arm, which is depicted in states number 36? No, ma'am, other than the bruising on the wrist. And would that have been caused by any of the medical treatment that you provided to her that day? No, ma'am. And to back up and say the bruising was that we noted was there before we even started our ACLS treatments. <clears throat> and states exhibit number 27. Did you notice that bruising? That looks to be the back of the neck, and I did see that when I rolled her over for the back blows. And I think you talked about the pelvis area, which is depicted in the state's number three. Are those injuries that you talked about in the pelvis area? Yes, in yes, ma'am. And if you could use a pointer as to what areas you're talking about. Just notice some bruising here, or discoloration in these two areas here. Now those blue, what looks like to be blue pads that's on her in that area, would they have um, contributed to those bruising at all? No, this is just a sticker. It's an electro, so it's just, it's just like putting a, a Band-Aid on. Were those bruises there prior to you? Did you, did anyone that was working on her between the two paramedics and the two EMT, in, in, EMTs put those stickers on her? Yes. Were those bruises present prior to those stickers being put on? Yes. And state's exhibit number 48. <laughs> Say, is, what's oh, same thing, yes, yes, it was there before the electrode was put on. Okay. And this area right here that's kind of reddish, was that there as well? Uh, yes, ma'am. I mean, I don't recall the, the specifics of it because of the, the, what was going on, but I do remember there was being some discolorations in that area. I can't say without, you know, certainty that that very dark spot was there, but there was discoloration there. After, as you're uh, doing the observation of her body, what else is going on? Uh, we're continuing with the CPR and the breathing, and uh, every three to five minutes we're administering a round of epi. Uh, they do um, 
I did not perform this skill. This is an, uh, this is typically, like I said, the, an EMT skill. They uh, will, and it sounds horrible, but we have something called a bone gun, a bone drill, that drills a needle into their to the to the bone in the leg. Did you do that? Before? I did not. Okay. Let me ask you, um, at some point, do you arrive at the hospital? Yes. How long is the trip from 1521 Lincoln to the hospital? It is 16.4 miles away. We l departed the house at 1809.03 and arrived at the hospital at 1826.39. And once you arrive at the hospital, what occurs? Uh, in route, of course, we call them and let them know we're coming and what, what we have and what to expect. Uh, once we back up to the ambulance, uh, to the ramp at the hospital, at the ER, we're collecting our equipment onto the stretcher, and uh, we go in and give report. The, the, uh, the room that we went into this particular time was just inside the door to the left. And at that point, are you done with your medical treatment of the day? Uh, we will assist the ER staff for a short period of time until everything gets changed over and we're given our report to make sure that all equipment gets changed over, all information gets disseminated. And if they need us to stay in and, and, and assist with, a, with the arrest, we will. There was a, a, quite a few people in the room at that time. But sometimes you get stuck in, the, in a position where you, where you just need to stay there and continue doing what you're doing. And, and I remember that's what had happened with me. At some point, did you turn over care to Layla to the hospital? Yes, ma'am. In your 25 years um, as a paramedic, have you ever seen the type of bruises that you observed on Layla um, as to someone who had bad or improper kind of? Uh, no, ma'am. In your 25 years as a paramedic, have you ever seen someone to present with those types of injuries from improper CPR? No, ma'am. Have you ever been told, you arrived at a scene and been told that someone had applied improper Heimlich? No, ma'am. So you don't know what improper Heimlich would look like? No, ma'am. Because you've never been told that anyone did it improperly, correct? That's correct. And the same is true for CPR? Yes. You don't know whether a person, what a person looks like after improper CPR because you haven't been told. I've whether. witnessed improper CPR and then taken over that CPR. And you've witnessed improper CPR on who? On several calls that I ran. Most of the people that we run cardiac, cardiac arrest with, the lay people perform the CPR not correctly. And uh, are these on children or on adults? Both. Both. And when you say they don't do it, Correctly, what is it that they don't do correctly? Uh, it's, it's numerous things. They're upset, you know. They, they, they're very nervous about it. So they, they could be doing it uh, in the wrong area, not enough, uh, pausing too much, that type of stuff. But you've never seen them give adult CPR to a child, right? Well, that, that's kind of hard to... Um, to disseminate because the only difference is a half inch compression with, depth. With the adults, it's a half inch more? Yes, ma'am. You go two inches down? Yes, ma'am. But you go one and a half inch down for a child? Yes, ma'am. And you use three fingers, correct? That's according to how big the child it is. It's a, on an infant, it's typically encircled around the infant and use your thumbs or you use two fingers. Okay. If it's a little older, two and above, and it's kind of a judgment call on the weight of the child, you'll use one hand. And um, do you know what she was instructed to do with no, CPR? No, So you have no idea what she did? No, ma'am. And you said the house was clean? Things yes, ma'am. Things were in order? Yes, ma'am. No signs of struggle? No, ma'am. And... Um, you could hear at one point with the BVM, you could hear bilateral breaths, correct? Once I got her innovated and listened, I could hear bilateral breath sounds. Okay. And um, with regard to the 
regards to the Heimlich maneuver, it's a different process for a child than it is for an adult, isn't that correct? Uh, yes. And how do you do a Heimlich on a child? It's a, it's a little more difficult according to how tall they are. Typically, you do the back blows like I did when we got there. You do the back blows? Yes, ma'am. You hit on the back? Mm -hmm, the upper back. And uh, sometimes people can hit in the wrong place, can't they? Sure. You wrote a report in this case, correct? Yes, ma'am. When did you write the report? Uh, it was the night of the call. After the call was over with? Yes, ma'am. About what time? That's tough to say. It was, it was pretty late. It may have been even closer to midnight. It's fair to say that you put in your report everything that happened that you thought was of import. Yes, ma'am. And you didn't have any conversation with Jennifer Rosenbaum other than to ask her about any history with the child, correct? That's correct. Otherwise, you didn't question her? No, ma'am. You didn't talk to her? You didn't have a conversation with her? No, ma'am. You were working on the child? That's correct. Thank you. That's all I have. Okay. Those bilateral breaths that you were hearing, was that after you had intubated her? Yes, that was would be mechanical ventilation that we were delivering. Okay. Well, does that mean that she was breathing on her own and out? No, ma'am. Were you breathing for her? We were breathing for her. And when you were performing CPR, were you using your fingers, one hand, or two hands? One hand. Okay. And Ms. Moll asked you about, you know, um, let me ask you, when I said improper, have you ever been on the scene where someone, a lay person, has reported that they have given a high Yes. Did the person or persons that you observed after that lay person gave the Heimlich maneuver, have you ever seen anyone look like Layla Dane did when you saw her? No, ma'am. The same thing with CPR? No, ma'am. You come up on scenes where lay persons have done CPR? Yes, ma'am. Has any of those people ever looked like Layla Dane did? No, ma'am. And Ms. Mull asked you about those blows to her back. If someone is delivering blows to her back improperly, would you expect to see injury from the top of her neck to the bot to the top of her buttocks? No, ma'am. Nothing. Sort of true though. If it was improperly being done, it can be improperly done in a number of ways. Isn't that correct? I assume you're speaking of the Heimlich maneuver. Yes. Yes, ma'am. It can be. Uh, so what you have seen in your experience may have been one one way of applying the Heimlich maneuver. Another, Ms. Rosenbaum may have applied the Heimlich maneuver in a different way than what you've seen, correct? Yes, I, I assume so, yes, ma'am. And where in your report did you write anything about a broken arm or a bowed arm? Uh, I did not write that down. You didn't, you didn't write that anywhere in your report? No, ma'am. It's not in the EMT's report either by any of your coworkers at all, is it? No, ma'am. If you hit somebody on the on the back, you can cause a bruise. Yes, if I hit someone on the back, I can cause a bruise. Yes. If you hit someone in the center, sort of in the waist, on the back, you can hurt someone and cause a, a bruise there, can't you? Yes, ma'am. If you do it all the length of the person's body, you can create a bruise in every position, can't you? Yes, ma'am, if there's a heartbeat, yes. Okay. And it's fair to say, is it not, that having a, somebody do compressions, 90 compressions, uh, improperly, if she's going further than one inch and a half, that might cause some damage, isn't that correct? I'm not at liberty to just say that one way or another. Why know. do you just go an inch and a half? That is what the uh, AHA guideline, American Heart Association guidelines require. And do they tell you what happens if you go more than an inch and a half? Uh, it is talking about, so it could be improper, could cause damage. Could cause damage to what? I'm not sure. Internal organs, isn't that correct? I would assume, yes. Thank you, I have nothing further. If they're doing improper CPR, 
Let me ask you, do you see any injury to her chest area at all? Not in this picture, no. Do you recall seeing any injury to her upper chest area? Not that I can recall. Is that where you would expect CPR to be performed, in the upper chest area? Yes, ma'am, between the nipple line. Would you expect it to see it down here, in her waist area, in her pelvic area? No, ma'am. It wouldn't make sense to be performing CPR compressions on her pelvis? No, ma'am. What about on her vagina? No, ma'am. What about on her inner thighs? No, ma'am. What about on her neck? No, ma'am. What about under her chin? No, ma'am. So the area that you would expect to see bruising from a lay person not knowing how to do it, did you see any injuries? No, ma'am. And you said to Ms. Moe, sounded real important, bruising comes when? Uh, it's bleeding. So if you're bleeding, you, you need a heartbeat to did bleed. Did Layla Daniel have a heartbeat? No, ma'am. Did she ever have a heartbeat when you went into the house, when she was in the ambulance, or when you took her in the hospital? No, ma'am. Nothing further. Do you know whether she had a heartbeat prior to your getting there? Prior to me getting there, no, ma'am. You don't know, do you? No, ma'am. So when she sustained those bruises on her back, she must have had a heartbeat, correct? When those bruises occurred, I would assume yes. Furthermore, isn't it true that when you do one of the improper, one of the many improper ways of doing Heimlich maneuver is to come around the child and thrust upwards yes, into the abdomen region? And that's wrong, isn't that? Uh, you do wrap around, you, you get into the abdomen, and you do thrust up towards the diaphragm. But if you go too low, you end up inflicting injuries lower down beyond the abdomen. Isn't that correct? I couldn't really speak of that. I, I don't know. I've never done that and never seen it done that low to, to answer that with any but kind of certainty. But you would expect that if you did it that low, you would get injuries, don't you? <laughs> And that might account for the injuries. It's a lot of soft tissue there. It's a lot of, you can move around a lot in that area without it causing any type of injury. But there's a spine in the back there, isn't there? Oh, yeah. And the spine with is what's force. absorbing, with enough force, yeah. you end up causing some serious damage. Isn't that true? Yes, ma'am. If you've got enough force to make it to the spine. Gibson, do you know any of those bruises that you observed if they happened on November the 17th of 2015? Do I know if they occurred then? Yes. I do not know that. Were they there when you got there? They were there when I got there. But you don't know when they could have happened? I don't know if it was that day, days before. I do not know. Nothing further. Nothing further. Thank you. You may step down. Thank you. You're excused if there's no objection. No objection from the state. Ladies and gentlemen, what we're going to do is we're going to take a 15-minute break and then